So, um, let's see. Give me one second here. Okay, excellent. Can everyone hear me okay? Dave, can you hear me loud and clear? I can hear you. Excellent. Great. Uh, well, welcome everyone uh, to the virtual training on Open Data GIS and Civic Resiliency. To go ahead and get started, we are with the Nash Public Safety GIS Foundation today and the District of Columbia Office of the Chief Technology Officer. In just a couple moments, we'll do some introductions to our instructor. Great. Uh, and with that, uh, my name is Rebecca Harned. I am a Senior Program Manager with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, and I will be facilitating and moderating today's session for you. And with us today, and we're excited to have uh, Dave Cook, who is the Public Safety and Homeland Security Geospatial Liaison with the District of Columbia's Office of the Chief Technology Officer. And we're excited to have Dave today, and I'd like uh, to give Dave a couple of moments to share a little bit about his background for you. Dave, over to you. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. So, uh, everyone, my name is Dave Cook. Um, I am, uh, as Rebecca said, with uh, OCTO, which stands for Office of the Chief Technology Officer in the District of Columbia, um, and work as the Public Safety and Homeland Security um, Geospatial Liaison, which in essence is really about how do we help uh, that community and how do we help really anybody in the district, whether you're talking about the public or whether you're talking about government users, whether you're talking about people outside the district that have um, needs that or problems that come within the district, how do we better enable them to both work with um, and do their jobs more effectively with, with GIS? Um, to give you a bit of my background, um, I have uh, been with GIS in some form or fashion, I think like many people, for many years, um, probably nearly 20. Um, and have worked both inside government, um, have worked with geospatial companies, um, have worked in um, other companies that do intelligence-focused uh, uh, activities, including GeoInt, um, and have ultimately kind of found my way back to, uh, to government um, in some form or fashion, um, and particularly in local government. Um, you know, this is where a lot of things really happen, and. Uh, where problems can be really immediate. And the district is really very unique in its ability because it's kind of a state, it's definitely a city, and it also has a number of federal actors. So we're really um, kind of at the nexus of a number of different areas. But I'm really happy to be with everybody here today. Excellent, thank you, Dave. And we're excited to have you. Great, so we're just gonna cover about who NAPSIG is for those of you who may not be familiar. Uh, so the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. And our vision is that a nation of emergency responders and leaders are equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcomes for survivors. Uh, and we do that through a myriad of different programs um, and in support of our, our mission as a whole, which is really equipping those folks um, with the knowledge, skills, and resources so that they can be successful in applying location-enabled decision support technology uh, for preparedness and across the spectrum of response, recovery, prevention, protection, and mitigation. The purpose of today's training session is to provide you with awareness level training on innovations in applying open data and GIS to enhance civic resiliency and public safety. So you'll be seeing today a myriad of different solutions that Dave and the team over in the District of Columbia's Office of the Chief Technology Officer has been working on to actually make that real, make it tangible to the community, to the emergency responders, but also to the citizens uh, of the district in the, in the area as a whole. 
So some of the key terminology that you're going to hear today, uh, we do want to make sure that we cover. One of those key terms is resiliency. Uh, we know it's, it's somewhat of a, of a buzzword uh, in our field today, but what we're talking about today in terms of resiliency is how we streamline decision making to maximize preparedness and readiness by the community. And so we know that there are a lot of definitions out there for resiliency and those ring true at many different levels. Uh, but we do want to hone in and, and, and we want folks to recognize what it is we mean during today's session by that term or buzzword resiliency. The other piece of terminology that we want to be sure that we touch base on is what is meant by open data, right? That was in the title of today's virtual training session. And so a, a short definition for you all is it, it is essentially the idea that certain data should be freely available to everyone to use and republish. And we're going to show you today actually how uh, a lot of data is made open uh, to the community to consume and to use however they see fit um, and to support their efforts in the community um, and across the different, the different agencies that support public safety and homeland security in the District of Columbia. And, and Dave will talk a little bit about those terms and what they mean to him kind of as he goes through his training today. So what do we hope you're going to gain out of this? What are, what are the objectives of our training session today? Number one, we want you to gain ideas for using civic technology and volunteer communities and platforms so that you can enhance your preparedness efforts in your communities. So the idea that you can take um, lessons learned and best practices that you'll see today and, and bring those same concepts and ideas into your own communities. We'll show you how DC Octo is planning to lead the path in creating and contributing to open source platforms that allow GIS professionals that support public safety and homeland security to build and strengthen civic resiliency in their local communities. We'll also work with you today to develop ideas for using open data, GIS, and civic technology to engage public, the public, the general public, and engage community-based preparedness. And so while today's session, due to the large volume and number of participants that we have, we, you won't have the ability to ask over the phone your questions, uh, but you certainly, we, we encourage you to share questions in the Q&A area and in the chat features within WebEx. Uh, so we will dedicate some time at the end, and really that's intended to be that forum to developing those ideas for how you can apply what you see today into your own communities and ask related questions. So a brief agenda before we pass it over to Dave. Uh, today we're going to cover four major areas. Uh, the first area will be the, an overview of relationships between infrastructure and data. Then Dave is going to go into a, an overview as well uh, to ensure that we get a baseline understanding of the platform and what we mean by the platform. And then the third part will be a framework and solutions for decision making. So this is where Dave's going to share with us a number of different open data solutions and best practices for how they're engaging the civic community in the use of GIS and open data and how that supports various different decision making workflows uh, that support and enhance both preparedness and resiliency. And then last but not least, as I mentioned, we will have a short question and answer period at the end using the WebEx chat feature and WebEx Q&A feature. And with that, um, we are going to pass presenter privileges over to Dave. So just bear with us one moment here. All right. Great. And I am the presenter. Um, so you sure are. I am, wonderful. All right, so with that, um, I have um, a few slides here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, thanks, Rebecca, um, Dave, for that. Could, great, Dave, could we just make sure, if you could click on the Quick Start tab and hit the Share Your Screen button first, please. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Should be right. in, your, in your WebEx Event Center. There's a, yeah. a tab, of, there you go, yes. Excellent. All right. So here we are. 
So with that, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, and um, I'm going to kind of walk through here. I've got a, a few slides here. But one of the things that I also want to do, as Rebecca um, alluded to, is to really um, show some examples of some basic applications that we've done. But, you know, even in their most basic form, um, you know, whether we put them together quickly just to meet a particular kind of need or um, are just exposing um, certain kinds of capabilities to the general public, you know, they've all turned out to be quite effective, um, whether it's delivering government services or just allowing citizens to be more engaged. So what I want to uh, really start off with here, um, as you can see the title of the presentation, we talk about open data or community data. It's GIS community data and civic resiliency in Washington, D.C. And that's what I'm really going to be focused on here today, um, is, is talking about the capabilities that um, the district has both uh, worked to build and has uh, invested in and the ways in which we've really gone out and engaged the public. I will put a big disclaimer, though, up front here. Um, it is it would be remiss of me not to, uh, to say that um, by no means is this simply, um, this simply an effort on my part. There are a number of people um, on the GIS team and within the citywide data warehouse and within Octo in general that have really worked hard at, uh, at making data um, and making good capabilities available to the, to the DC uh, public. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and get started. The first thing that I want to focus on, though, as you see, um, is the focus on a, a change slightly from open data to community data. And that really kind of gets to the heart of the presentation, because what I want to talk about are resources that we have, um, because they are resources that whether the city um, owns it, or the city has to collect the data or has to purchase that data, regardless, what we're talking about is you know, open data gives you that idea of um, it's a data that somehow is being exposed when really deep down the data is ours to begin with. You know, we're a community of first responders and emergency managers um, here in and of ourselves, um, but this data is something that is really a part of our community. We really want to get to the, to the heart of what, uh, what that data is about and how it can ultimately reshape um, civic resiliency. So the first thing that I'll tell you is, um, just like everybody probably on the phone, I was lucky to see a list of some of the folks that were here uh, or that registered for this. I mean, we all have our own stories. You know, we all have our stories about our own problems in our own jurisdictions, the flood that happened, the wildfire that happened, the natural disaster that occurred in some location. You know, these are just a couple of examples. Usually when you think of Washington, D.C., you think of monuments, you may think of the Lincoln Memorial, you may think of the Capitol, you may think of political gridlock. But regardless, you know, we have our own problems in our own jurisdictions, and every one of us um, is really invested in those problems. You know, how do we understand them? How do we really get to the heart of them? This is just a perfect example of, of the Memorial Bridge, which, you know, for many years was considered to be, um, you know, a preeminent bridge in terms of, you know, its, its structural capabilities, um, in terms of its ability to bear um, um, heavy weight uh, as people travel into the district. But we see these days that it's corroded. You have other examples of stories here with the Philadelphia, unfortunately, the, the train crash that happened right outside of Philadelphia, or with in the bottom uh, corner there with, uh, with Hurricane Sandy. But we all have our own stories in our own jurisdictions. What I want to talk about today, though, is how we can abstract and how we can use the power of community data and geospatial to really look broadly across those stories. What not just can we understand about our own individual problems, but what can we collectively do, what can we share that allow us to really tackle these problems on a very broad basis? And I think community data um, in the form of open data and geospatial really allow us a gateway to do that. And to just give you an example of the, re the, the kinds of questions that we often ask within the district, this is something that I got a notice on my phone literally before we, uh, we got started, probably about 15, 20 minutes ago. Um, a bomb threat um, uh, at the uh, Senate office building. This happened right around, um, you look about 123, uh, initially at 1241, and then at 123 a tweet was sent out um, indicating that there wasn't necessarily any problem. Now what's important about this though, because what's important about this story is, again, the power of data and the power of geospatial. What is it that we can really take away from, uh, from this? Because you know, here we've got a situation where we used to never think about communicating through Twitter, and now that's exactly how we, we uh, determine what's going on with the incident and whether or not the incident's open or closed. So again, what we're, we're looking at is we're dealing with ways in which we've got to rethink the problem. 
Um, that's what I really want to highlight here is we have to think about how can we look at a problem differently. We can use the tools that we've had before, but we have to reshape it and rethink it. One of the biggest challenges I think that public safety and uh, Homeland Security and emergency managers face today is the problem actually of Twitter. It can be a huge benefit, but also think about the problem that you face when you get on scene and you have to deal with 100 people who have been tweeting about a problem for 10 minutes. So you've got how many people who know more about what's going on necessarily than you do just when you first arrive. So we really have to figure out how we can harness all of these different capabilities and make sense of it all. How do we build resiliency out of massive amounts of data? How do we make sense of it? So if we take all of that back though, um, and we take really going back to thinking about, you know, what this presentation is about open data or community data, GIS and resiliency, I want to go back to um, kind of a presentation that, uh, that was back in 2008, um, and it was at the Ezra User Conference. Um, I was working there at the time, and this was something similar to um, what was said uh, in the, um, the Federal GIS Conference. That's not 2010, I'm sorry, this was this year, 2015 an error on my part. But um, when you think about geospatial, I think if, you know, many people here are familiar, but, you know, if you go to anyone, if anybody has to explain or you have to explain to somebody what you do, you say, how many people have used Google Maps? What's the first thing that they always do? They always look for where can they find their house? You know, this was something that Governor O'Malley highlighted back, um, back in 2008. And in 2015, he was talking about geospatial at that time and what really it can offer and what it can mean. And he had a really compelling quote at the time, which said, you know, the ability of geospatial really to open up government, to really empower decision making, to really allow it to become a source of um, a, a source of preparedness, a source of planning, a source of mitigation. It can really offer what you would call a crowdsourced healing, you know, of the deepest kind. And to me, it was compelling because you go from help me find my house to crowdsource healing to the deepest kind. That's seven years difference. You know, think about how the technology has changed, how data has changed, how its availability has changed, and how our concepts about geospatial have changed. I think about how geospatial has changed in one particular way, you know, because as I was putting this presentation together, I really thought about resiliency and what it means. Now. I actually just moved, um, not too far, um, don't quite live in the district, but um, I moved from uh, Maryland over to uh, Arlington, moving close to a really great example of resiliency. I live close to the Marine Corps Memorial. Um, you couldn't find a better example within the district area and the monuments of what resiliency really looks like. You know, and I think about, um, actually I have to admit I'm a runner, but I got lost um, on my first time out uh, running around. What that really told me, though, was when I started to pull the presentation together was how did I need to rethink my sense of direction? And resiliency really requires rethinking. We all tend to be very spatial thinkers. I mean, geospatial location is just a naturally organizing principle. And it can be a natural organizing principle for resiliency as well. But resiliency requires rethinking these days. Just like Governor O'Malley changed from help me find my house to a crowdsourced healing of the deepest kind, we're talking about how resiliency can really require rethinking on three different levels. The first is really how do we rethink infrastructure? You know, we often talk about infrastructure in terms of, or we think about it, the public thinks about it in terms of bridges and roads, um, airports, train stations, you name it. You know, those, those are the typical kinds of things that we think about with infrastructure. But we've really become a very different society in the way of big data, that we have to think about data as infrastructure. And not only do we have to think about data as infrastructure, but we have to think about what we can build off of data as infrastructure. What kinds of things can we craft from it? How can we curate it? How can we build it? How can we turn it into something that we can do something with? How can we allow it to support situational and operational awareness? The second thing that we really have to rethink is management. You know, it's not simply anymore about how do we go to the specific kinds of problems. I mean, everybody knows the 911 system. Everybody deals with it in some capacity. Somebody calls, we respond. We have to rethink that, though, differently in the age of resiliency. We've got so many different things going on. We've got Twitter. We've got such a different universe that we're dealing with that we can't just necessarily respond to it. We have to get ahead of the problem. And the last piece that we really have to rethink in terms of resiliency is coordination because 
no longer really are disasters something that are isolated incidents. They're not something that has a one-time hit. You know, they have downstream effects. You know, they have effects that we have to live with for a significant amount of time. Just yesterday, I heard on NPR about the fact that um, drought, which dramatically affects the wildfire season out in California, cost us somewhere in the order of $20 billion. Um, I mean, there are significant downstream effects about how we have to deal with the disaster in every area now. The disasters aren't just isolated incidents. We have to change how we think about coordination. The first way in which we can change, really, in terms of our rethinking is how do we go from data to insight? You know, data, I, I come from you know, a law enforcement and intelligence background, so for me, data and the ability to transform that data really kind of follows a very specific path. It's data to information, information to, not, information to intelligence and knowledge, and then ultimately to insight. And insight is what enables decision making. We have to look at geospatial in order to allow us to streamline that process. And we have to look at civic engagement through geospatial to streamline that process. The second thing we have to look at is the change of mitigating disasters to mitigating risk. How do we not just go to the disaster, but how do we mitigate the risk around it? And then finally, we have to go from a very singular approach, not just involving just public safety emergency management, but how do we engage the public in a very coordinated campaign? And ultimately, resiliency is gonna begin with GIS because we have to go from owning the tools of geospatial. What I wanna talk about today is how do we democratize geospatial? How do we make geospatial for everyone? Sounds a little hokey, but really what I'm talking about when I'm talking about that is not just, for example, making data available, not just publishing it out there. Data is, you know, PDFs, a good joke that I heard about open data was that if you put it out in open data in a PDF format, that's sometimes the way in which it goes to die. You know, what I'm really talking about is not just how we take and, and make data available to someone, but how do we democratize it? How do we make them as tools available to people that they can do something with, enabling them to really, really understand it well? There are already, fortunately, community efforts, though, that are underway in regards to this. Um, I just can look at a few examples here of um, one jurisdiction, right, to uh, um, right to the to, next to us in, in Washington, D.C., and that's Maryland with their mapping and GIS data portal, the Maryland IMAP. You have another example with Kentucky and their open GIS data uh, capabilities. And then you have an example right there, which I will dive into that website in a, in a few minutes, with the District of Columbia. You know, we have these open data capabilities already out there, and more importantly, we have them available in geospatial format. There are also federal efforts that are out there underway right now. Um, it's not simply just uh, something that's being done at the local level. And oftentimes, as I've tended to find over the last 20 years or so within geospatial, the great thing about GIS is because it's so relatable, we all kind of tend to meet in the middle. But this is an example of a risk mapping progress um, uh, from the FEMA website. And you've got an example here just of something that is so easy to relate to, a risk map. You've got levees funded, levees complete, Riverines funded, riverines complete, coastal, all the way down to watersheds. But this is a way in which you can access not only a very broad view, but you can drill into understanding what federal efforts are undertaken in regards to risk. So risk and managing risk, as opposed to just managing the disasters, how do we handle risk and resiliency, is clearly something that is growing to a great degree. So I'm gonna break the, the um, parts of the presentation here down real quick into you know, really our first uh, piece. How do we go resiliency beginning with GIS by transforming data really into insights? And data oftentimes, um, if you haven't guessed, I like to speak in metaphors, but data oftentimes, if you think about it, can be like sand. Um, the government, you know, government data and open data in particular is often like sand. Data is something that is really like pieces of sand made up often of, of individual cells. Now, our growing civic landscape can really be a number of different things. You know, in some cases, it can be the desert because we create lots and we create and capture lots and lots and lots of data. It doesn't necessarily mean, though, that just because we capture all that data, oftentimes it's part of our mission, that that data can't turn into something pretty powerful. We can build from it, just as you can see there. The data that we collect, just like in those tiny cells, just in those things that we get in 911 calls, when we're getting the time the call started and the time the call ended, when we dispatched and when we actually cleared the call. 
or in a fire call or in an emergency management, in a hazard, in an earthquake warning. In every case, those are all individual grains of data that we can build a greater capability off of. The only problem that happens, though, is what happens when the weather changes. What can happen when the weather changes when a sand, uh, with a sandcastle? All of a sudden, the tide can rise, the, the weather can change, and the castle gets wiped out. Not only, though, can we build from data, we can craft from it. And that's really what insight is about. It's not just taking the data and turning it into something different. It's taking the data and turning it into something completely new, turning it into something that we can actually visualize through, that we can analyze through, that we can build new intelligence off of, and that we can turn into insight that enables decision making. And that's one of the things that we've really just undertaken here within the district with our approach to data and how we make it available to the citizens. And these are just two quick examples. You know, we're not only able to, um, by exposing data to the public and allowing, uh, exposing the data and exposing it in a meaningful way that allows the public to really use it, we're able to build new geographies off of that. We're able to build new capabilities off of it. We're allowing the data to be something different. You know, and one of the first examples here is civic broadband. You know, right here, this is based upon the map that you see here, the screenshot, is based upon a web app that we built that is available um, and allows us to really understand the speed test and the speeds of the data that we have throughout the district. We can understand it in relation to community anchor institutions. We can look at it in terms of wireless hotspots. We can also look at broadband adoption rate. But in every case here, what we're able to do is really kind of create a new geography. The geography is based upon what kind of access do I have? Businesses work off of this. Other people build their events off of this. Our hackathons could be built off of this. In every case, we're building new communities, and those communities are really going to be the crux of how D.C. can become more resilient. Or in another case, we've got a new geography with real property here. Now, based upon our real property map, there's another company called Create.io, um, which you can go out to their website. Um, that's available. Um, it's really a great example of open geospatial data in the marketplace. And this is a Create.io is a DC startup that was formed back in 2011 by a couple of um, real estate guys in a cramped DC apartment. You know, and then they were really a dedicated family of architects and designers and technologists. And really what they wanted to do was to be able to visualize the data and to use it more tangibly. You know, they took the sand that they had and they wanted to kind of create their own castle out of it. Now, it may not be the only castle that we have. But this is something, again, that allows for, and I'll show a, a more detailed screenshot uh, soon, this allows you to actually visualize DC um, in a very high-definition 3D environment. We can also craft um, new levels of cross-understanding. And here's another example of really drilling into, the, um, uh, drilling into the FEMA risk map, understanding a flood study. Um, and particular examples where we've got levees, we've got coastal areas. Um, that are different kinds of projects. But again, we're able to dive into level of cross understanding, not only understanding what's happening at the district level, but also at the federal level. So risk, risk and resiliency in particular, resiliency um, in terms of data, the first piece that we really need to look at and understand when we're talking about strategy for open data um, and a strategy for community data is how we take that data and we transform it into insight. And what we've really learned within the district is how can we expose all of that data and then engage the community effectively. It's not enough for us simply to put the data out there. We have to provide the tools, we have to provide the techniques, the methods, the, the spatial capabilities, and we have to provide people that are willing to go out and engage with other civic groups. Whether, for example, here at one of our startup uh, areas called 1776, other parts of the civic hacking and startup community in every instance, what we've tried to do with geospatial is kind of create those new geographies. We try to create new communities based off of that. All of those communities and capabilities ultimately can allow us to be more resilient because they can do more with the technology based upon what we've given them. The second thing that we really need to think of when we rethink, um, when we're rethinking resiliency is engaging, resiliency engaging with GIS by going just from managing disasters to managing risk. So many of you have probably heard of the Presidential Directive, OMB 1313, and what that really you know, is designed to do is it comes from, uh, it's a Presidential Directive that was designed to make data 
more um, make data more available. Um, and it's a it's a, um, a directive that basically said expose the data um, on the federal level as much as possible. But what what I think we really have to take away from that is not simply the fact that data is now more available. It can't just be you know the data is out there. It's not enough just to expose the data. It's more important for us also to be able to have the data in a way that is meaningful and have valid data, have data that can be enriched, have data that is something that you know, we can really do something with. We need to be able to capture it, verify it, validate it, have it cleansed, and then have it available to someone so they can build off of it. So think about the spatial multi, I want what, in terms of thinking about how we go from managing disasters to managing risk and employing geospatial, I encourage you to think about the spatial multiplier and risk. So the data that we often collect um, on the government side, the data that we're required to collect as part of our mission, over 95% of that data has a geographic component. It used to be roughly about 80%, I would say, but that number has only significantly gone up. Um, that goes to the idea that spatial really isn't all that special. It's not that unique. You know, over 95% of the data has a geographic component, component to it. Businesses often lose their lifeline when critical infrastructure is hit. And this is based not just upon numbers that, that um, I've come up with. This is based upon a global assessment report on disaster risk. You know, the spatial multiplier risk is significant. Businesses lose their lifeline. Survey businesses under this global assessment report, this just came out last year, survey businesses noted disruptions in power and water supply and telecommunications as top concern. And over 90% of the damage occurs within local disasters. So we have to think locally, we have to act globally, but you have to remember that there is a significant spatial multiplier in risk. We have to move from managing disaster to managing risk, and we have to enable the community to really be able to understand the problems that they're facing just as we're managing them. And this is a global assessment risk report at a glance, really the wake-up call that comes out of that report, which is disasters are even costlier than we thought. I don't know um, everyone that's on the call, but I'm sure that anybody, if they're having to look at the magnitude of the disasters that we're facing now and the capabilities that we're having to build against, they are significantly greater um, than disasters are in terms of magnitude than the things that we faced maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Um, those are all significant. It's not to diminish them. But you think about Katrina. You think about the potential for flood. You think about Sandy. You know, because our networks are so interconnected, because we're so reliant on so many different pieces of infrastructure. Disasters are much more costly than we ever thought. A lack of a fur engaged Geospatial Community Foundation is extremely expensive. And one of the things that we've really tried to do within the district, if you're thinking about you know, what is possible, one of the things that we've really tried to do is make sure that we've gone out and engaged the community. We have um, folks on, on the, the OCTO team that are really, their focus is how do we engage the public? How do we make sure that we're doing the things that we need to do in order to have people aware of it? Because disasters are so costly, we want to be able to have people hack together capabilities if they need them. The foundations of really, if you want to look at, at, at our history, the foundations of DCGIS, you know, our history within GIS goes back a pretty long ways. Um, we go back actually to our first ortho flight back in um, uh, 1995. And the NCPC is the capital, National Capital Planning Commission. Um, in 2001, we had the Octo DC GIS program. In 2002, we have a steering committee by mayoral order. 2005, a strategic plan that looked at a federated data model. 2009, we have an executive order expansion. 2009 as well, an updated GIS strategic plan. 2010, the ELA. 2012, a business plan. And 2014, an open data directive which is highlighted right there. Each of these, I know the slides will be made available, each of these is actually hyperlinked there. So if you want to go back and look and see how we've really built capabilities and what it is that we're able to do um, and what we've, we've really focused on, this is really almost a 20-year process when you look at it of building the foundations of, of DCGIS. And these are just an example of some of our, uh, our data participants. You've got the DC Association of Realtors, Water, Housing, Columbia, a District of Columbia Office of Planning, Consumer Regulatory, Regulatory Affairs, DDOT, District Department of Transportation, HCMA, OCTO, FEMA, USGS, Metropolitan Police, National Park Service. 
we have really made a significant attempt. The D.C. government has made and invested in a significant amount of, a significant amount of time and resources really to get the message of geospatial out there. One of the things that I can say um, as somebody who hasn't been with D.C. Um, or worked with D.C. that long is, you know, it's a great example of how capabilities have really built over time and how it's really required an investment at the ground level, but it's also required investment from the senior leadership. You know, it's had to, it came down with the mayoral order. Um, you know, the capabilities are highlighted, you know, across, um, uh, across government. It's not something where it's an isolated instance of one particular piece of geospatial software. You know, it's really about how do we build that very firm uh, foundation around data, and then how do we ultimately transform that into insight, managing uh, risk over managing just simply disasters. And these are just some of our data access points that I want to um, want to show you. So these are, you know, two particular cases where we've exposed um, we've exposed data to the public. Um, we've done this through um, REST endpoints. Um, so what you're able to do is with a URL, um, GeoJSON, however you want to go about it, you can actually go to DCGIS and um, uh, to our website you know, with the hyperlink there is at the bottom, and you're actually able to connect to and consume our um, geospatial data services if, if needed. Those data services can be updated on our side. Um, you won't notice a difference other than more data points than what you may have had before or more attribution than what you've necessarily had before. But one of the key pieces of this is it exposes that data. It really democratizes it. What we've also done is created um, a portal that um, allows the, the public to, uh, to access it. Here's dcgismaps.rts.com. And this is actually something that I will highlight and show you real quick. Um, oops, wrong one. Um, and this is the open data portal right here. Um, and then we've also got um, the District of Columbia. This is actually um, one of our instances where you can look at oblique aerial images, um, uh, environmental scan, pothole apps, bike commuting. In every case, we're able to create our own maps, our own uh, content, our organization, or, or uh, information across the organization. So, okay. So, the next piece that I want to go into, being cognizant of time, we've got about 20 minutes left here, is re how resili resiliency really can advance with GIS. How can we go from singular instances of managing a particular kind of disaster to how can we really create a coordinated campaign? Because if there is one thing that resiliency really relies upon is the ability to be coordinated and coordinated in particular with the public. That's part of the key about open data. I mean, I remember six, seven years ago, we never really talked about open data that much. I mean, those REST endpoints that allow you access to geospatial data, that's amazing. That would have been phenomenal capabilities that, that we didn't have. Um, when I initially worked in law enforcement, we were shipping around data on CDs, occasionally able to send it through email, but even then we really didn't have the kind of capabilities that we have now. You know, it's amazing what we're able to do. But in order to build up resiliency, it can't just be how do we plan for that singular incident and how do we do it in a box or in isolation. It has to be a coordinated campaign and it has to engage the public. So one example that is really spectacular, um, and I don't know whether they're on the line, but um, one really great example is uh, CHAMP. And CHAMP is a um, community hazard assessment and mitigation planning system, and this is something that's done by the state of Kentucky. And what you really see here is how to build a great foundation for community resiliency. Um, this, this will be available, the slides will be available. You can also go out to their website, and uh, I'll include that on the slides. But you get really the whole understanding of community profile, assessments, plans, projects, funding, and then the assessment of the projects. How do you manage those projects long term? But it really invests in ways to, um, into uh, how to build resiliency long term. You know, how do we get to that point that we're able to operationalize it? The second uh, piece that I want to talk about is how one of the things that we're really undertaking with um, uh, pre-disaster mitigation. So these are um, uh, two processes that, uh, that we've been looking at um, and something that we're doing within the district right now um, related to hazards. And one of the big benefits that we have of having a, the kind of granular data that we have is that we're actually approaching pre-disaster mitigation through hazards, um, not just in, not using only the, the 
data assets that come within it, but we're actually able to use our specific data um, in order to really model um, uh, flood ha and, and hazards effectively. We can really dig into whether we're doing the thyra, we're doing other processes, we can really dig into you know, identifying the threats and hazards of concern. We can really understand uh, different stages where we might have to um, look at hazards. Uh, at hazards. Um, we're really digging into in pre-disaster mitigation ways in which we can apply the specific data that we've got um, and have it be something that we're able to exchange with the public. What we're also building off of that, um, those data resources, and why we're making this a very coordinated approach, we're working with, with FEMA on this, is um, you know, building a single system of risk resilience um, and having an analysis process that really allows us to dig into um, understanding assets, threat, consequences, vulnerabilities, um, ultimately building towards um, resilience management. You know, what we want to uh, move from is something that is canned. We really want to have, using the granularity of the data that we've got, which we found real investments in the data, we really want to be able to build into something that um, that is going to allow us to, uh, uh, to plan long term. The next thing that we're really focused on is um, um, I'm going to, you know, I take that from a very high level uh, with uh, looking at Thyra um, and looking at that single system of resilience to a more basic um, approach because those are a little more abstract. I want to talk about a problem, though, briefly that, uh, that we have dealt with that really kind of digs into the heart sometimes of local government and that's trash pickup. So this is a, um, an example of something that happened earlier in the district this year. And this is an example of how you pull together a capability really quickly and why the infrastructure that we put in place that allows for insight really allowed this to happen. So we had a period of time earlier this year in the district and, and snow is pretty for everybody, I think, except for mayors um, and Department of Public Works because, um, you know, to them, it's, I can under, understandably, it's a headache. It's something that's got to be plowed and got off the streets so people can get to work and do the things that they need to do. Uh, one of the challenges that we have sometimes with snow is, um, is uh, the ability to collect trash. And in some, and you know, what we were focused on doing is um, we had a problem where um, trash didn't get picked up. We have a 311 system within the district that allows citizens to enter in, um, for lack of a better term, complaints. Um, they can be comments too, but you know, generally it's when they are looking for some kind of service from us, whether it's uh, picking up trash, whether it's cleaning up a particular area, whether it's somebody spotted um, a dead animal in the road and they, they want that picked up. But, you know, nonetheless, it's a way in which we can engage with the public. And it's rich with data about what the public really needs and what they expect. Um, in, this, in this particular instance, what we had had was um, a case where we missed trash and we wanted to develop an early warning system that would allow us to identify those problems before they started to emerge again. Now, this, uh, so what we were tasked with uh, in this particular case was to build that system and have it be um, geospatially enabled. So you're able to identify clusters, and we set the parameters as five or more incidents of missed trash within 500 feet within another within the last five days, so a series of five. Um, you know, we really wanted to look at and tackle the problem geospatially because the city wasn't really able to, if you, you could be on two sides of a ward or two sides of a particular kind of district and you wouldn't pick that problem up. What we were able to do though is build this particular web application right here. And in this particular case, this was something that we spun up initially, um, I should say, um, within about uh, 48 hours, um, at least as an initial capability. Um, and then after that, we're able to refine it and have worked consistently to kind of refine the algorithm. But we can look at things like multiple requests. We can look at the density for a particular area. We can look at wards. Um, we can look at open requests. But we were able to identify and understand the problem geospatially. Geospatial was ultimately what we settled on as the one way in which we could really have a better way to understand how we can deliver services to the citizens of the district. We've since been able to refine this, and we can plug in virtually any 311 data set. But the correlations that this really allows us to understand about resiliency, um, this is a great way in terms of an early warning system to get a clue into other problems that may be emerging throughout the district. You know, trash collection coming from law enforcement, trash collection combined with 
other kinds of problems related to graffiti, things like that, those can usually be really strong indicators of bigger problems that we've got out there and something that we need to probably uh, work closer with the community than what we've known before. But it's great for us to be able to have insight geospatially into what's going on with the community with just this one particular application. The next example that I want to talk about is the District FEMA CRS program, which is a community rating system. And this is something that was established in 1990 as a voluntary program under the NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program. Probably many of you are familiar with it. Now, in the, NF, in the, um, the NFIP, what we really have is we had to go back and look at and see um, how we could uh, rate um, areas within the district that are um, prone to flooding. And we were really trying to identify ways in which we could have, um, you know, more accurate assessments of um, uh, things through, or uh, more accurate assessments of flooding areas throughout the, uh, through the district. Um, it was really necessary in this particular case, as you can see with the web application there, to turn the data into something that we can do something with, you know, and this included integrating, intersecting, dissolving, interpolating, and sometimes even guessing a little when we were looking at these risk particular risk areas. And the end of the day, though, our data work really provided a, a detailed report for submission, a clear interactive map, and a road to sustainability that resulted in a more resilient DC. And ultimately, what we were able to do is find, through geospatial, progress and savings in the district. Now, the district and its residents ultimately saved money, and we were able to keep those dollars locally. So that when we conducted the, uh, the study through geospatial, what we were able to find is we saw a 5% premium reduction for each class. The class seven, which was the district goal, it resulted in the 394 average annual saving per residence related to flood insurance. And then the district government ultimately saved about $105,000 each year. Now that, for us, in terms of resiliency, is a really great example. And it's great not only because of what it showed geospatial could do and allowing the kinds of data sets that allow us to really understand the problem and then work with the problem, but it also builds um, community support. The last two things that I'll talk about are civic hacking um, and are some of our initiatives and our outreaches related to code to DC. And you have, in this particular case, RDC schools. This is something through our civic hacking community that helps the public personalize and visualize changes in school district boundaries within the district. Um, and with the Open Schools app, it also allows choosing a school in DC can be confusing, but we're able to support um, family decisions with data. What this really allows us to do with this one geospatial outreach and then have through, done through um, data that we've exposed to the public, it just allows us to engage the public more and allows us to build a better relationship, not only with the hacking community, but with people throughout the community. And then finally, the piece that I talked about earlier, which is Create.io, and um, this is a website that was built um, based upon um, uh, some of our open data. It's a powerful example, again, of uh, driving economic and development and um, investment decision making, you know, really um, uh, um, amazing capabilities in terms of um, the ability to visualize throughout the city. You can visualize in a 3D environment. I encourage everybody to go out to this website. So with that, community resiliency with GIS is really about democratizing data. It's really about democratizing not only the data, but capabilities. It's about managing risks, not just managing disasters, it's about making geospatial, capa uh, geospatial capabilities available and out there, giving people the tools and techniques to use them. And ultimately, I think the goal is to have people doing GIS without necessarily even knowing that they're doing GIS. So with that, that's what I'd have. Um, I will open it up, um, I think, from there for questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dave. Appreciate that. Sure. Great. And, um, we will, if, Dave, if you could pass the presenter privileges back over to me, that would be excellent. Um, and you can do that right from your participant bar there. There we go. You want to change, yes. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much. Great. So now we are about ready uh, to uh, take some
some questions and answers. I think, Dave, that was an outstanding overview of the work that you have going on and the examples of what I would consider some model practices for the nation. And really, you know, that ranges from just how we see data essentially as a community resource uh, to, you know, certainly the aspects of, uh, of the fact that 95% of that of data collected is, is geographic and the fact that we need to think a lot harder about how we can best utilize that. And, and you really gave some uh, some great examples of that. And I, a couple of those that I just want to highlight for folks to get the discussion going is around that, the, the application of geospatial for the thyra process. And I, I really liked the way that you laid out um, how you're thinking about that and the linkages across the entire threat hazard identification and risk assessment process. And I think that's one that can certainly be carried forward by other communities uh, and states that are engaging in that process as well. And, and, and the other piece being certainly some examples that you shared in terms of the early warning system for community level problems in terms of informing decision makers so, so that those early issues are addressed at the early warning stage versus when they escalate into becoming community problems. Um, be it a sanitation issue that during, you know, depending on the type of hazard, disaster, you know, could certainly pose a public health risk ranging to, you know, graffiti from a potential crime area. So really appreciate the, the diversity of examples shared there. Sure. Great. Um, it does look like we have a couple of questions that I'd like to make sure that we address that have been coming in um, by our participants. So what I'm going to do is uh, repeat a couple of those questions. Um, and, and see if we've got it working. Uh, let's see here. Okay, great. One question we have is with, from Eric Berman. Uh, he is with FEMA's, uh, the mitigation office there. His question is, have you done any earthquake modeling for the district? And if you did, did you use HAZIS? Um, the answer is no. Um, I have not done any earthquake modeling. Uh, me personally, no. Um, I don't have, uh, um, we, we, we did a mitigation plan um, and updated the mitigation plan. That was before I got here. Um, so it's a question, honestly, that I'd have to check on. I would have met, we, I know we've done work with, uh, uh, prior to me being here with Havis, um on, um, but I don't believe earthquake modeling was necessarily um, a key part of it. But that is a, a really good question and something that um, I'd like to follow up with um, further. I can say I haven't done it yet, but, um, what I can say t is, though, in the uh, in the that single system for risk resilience, um, is we will definitely factor earthquakes into into that because um, as uh, the earthquake we had here a few years ago really illustrated, those are significant problems, um, and we have to account for those unknowns because usually when those unknowns don't we haven't accounted for them, they become even um, even more significant. You know, the downstream effects are much greater than we anticipate. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that response back, Dave. That was great. I'm going to move on to the next question we have from uh, Daniel Stolb. Uh, and the question is, how have you been able to filter through social media uh, in regards to uh, disasters? Great question. Um, also, um, much more of a challenge than, um, um, than we thought. You know, there, there are a number of different, um, I, I, I'd be remiss with saying there are a number of different products out there that can um, help people sift through uh, through through uh, social media. Um, you know, the thing that, uh, that I, I kind of break it up into two parts because there's definitely the geo-enabled social media um, and the geotagged social media that actually puts something to a location, roughly speaking, that I think is, is, uh, is critical for us because it's something that we can do something with. There's also that massive amount of data that's out there that really you can only gain some level of sentiment about. Um, we don't have, um, you know, a number of tools. I don't have a number of tools of, available right now that really help you um, uh, filter through a ton of social media data um, just to sift it out because it, it's just so overwhelming. But um, those are some capabilities that we're we're working on, um, you know, because of this, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to go through. I can certainly um, recommend, or I, I wouldn't recommend. I would say I can tell you about products that I know that are available out there um, that, that can sift through those kinds of data. But 
As far as building something internally, we have not done that. Um, but there are products out there or things that can do that, capabilities that allow us to do. My big focus is ones that uh, geotag because that, um, if you look at a density or anything like that of those, um, that social media, then you usually can go somewhere pretty far with it. Excellent. Thank you. I think that's some, some really great insight in terms of how you take something like social media and, and, and take it into into becoming part of the solution, right? So, yeah. so, yeah. so great, great feedback there. I appreciate that. Uh, the next question I'd like to move on to is from Ahmed Asker. His question is, how do you deal with different open GIS data formats and data structures? So the way in which we deal with it, um, you know, one, well, I can say what from an availability standpoint, um, we make it available in as many formats as we can identify. Um, we certainly, uh, we've worked with um, some industry partners to allow our, um, our, um, capability, our, our data to be exposed in ways that they're able to consume it. If you go to the, that REST endpoint website, you'll find um, as many different kinds of tools that suit different kinds of geospatial viewers. Um, but our, you know, we, we really tried to make it available such that you can connect to our, um, our data website and pull down, you know, anything from XML to GeoJSON to any format that you want. I would say that, you know, our approach has been, a, you know, or the, the approach that we've adopted has been one that came from our charter around open data, which is, you know, when in doubt, we keep, we make the data open, um, unless there's a good reason to keep it. Um, hidden and with our particular capability, I think what we try to do is work with or identify as many relevant um, data formats and data sources as possible um, and then expose uh, the data in that format. We, we certainly try to do more rather than less. But we, what I would also say is what we try to do is make sure that we make the data available um, in a format that's got metadata, that is something that's understandable, something that you can work with that isn't simply um, uh, just exposing it and saying, good luck. You know, we try and do as many different uh, formats as we can. Excellent, thank you for that. Just to clarify, the website that you're referring to is the one that I have up on the shared screen right now, the opendata.dc.gov, is that correct? Yep. Excellent. So, so for the folks, you know, with that, I think that's a common question that, you know, many folks likely share. You can actually go right in here publicly and, and explore and, and see how they've set this up. And, and you can take a look at the data formats. And, and I think as Dave mentioned, an important point is the, the metadata and the data standards that are used um, and a, a, a use of, of commonly used standards that work across different platforms. So just to highlight that for folks and show you uh, where to go in the link there. So you can actually yeah. see there's a full list of DC data sets right here that you can search and explore. Great. Um, I'm going to move on to an, another question that we have. Uh, and this is actually, I think, a very good lead-on question from the last one. The question is, how does the availability of applicable standards support or limit your work? How does your data support national or regional data set developments is the second part of the question. Perhaps we could answer the, the standards question first. Um, so the, um, the, I mean, the availability of, um, the availability of standards, um, you know, I'm finding that it, I would say that it tends to support work um, more than, uh, more than limited. Um, but that's partly a result of um, we're still in, um, I think we're still in, in um, kind of new ground here. Um, you know, data in, in terms, I mean, we have, you know, data um, exchange formats and those have been around for some time, but, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, the way in which I found that it supported it is, um, you know, it's, it's just, it, you know, we're able to make the, you know, we're able to make data more, um, gosh, I'm saying data more open. Um, it's, that, it's not limiting. Um, it's not limiting by any stretch. Um, it, it, I'll, I'll, I'll actually go on to the, the next question and, and maybe I can, and this will give a better answer is, uh, how does the data support national regional data set development? Um, I think our data supports um, uh, national and regional data set development because of, you know, 
one of the things that we really try to focus on is how do we um, how do we coordinate across uh, you know coordinate across the national capital region. This has made it easier for us, for example, on something like NextGen 911 or what we have called the NCR Geospatial Data Exchange. In every circumstance, you know, whether we're working regionally or we're working nationally, um, you know, we're really able to um, we're really able to direct people to our website. Um, except in the case of very sensitive information, um, which is, you know, pretty limited kinds of things that we have, stuff like that. Um, we're able to, you know, build a kind of common community. Somebody can build a website that references us or we can support something like a National Capital Region Geospatial Data Exchange um, simply because we've exposed the data. Um, I, th I found, if anything, right now, you know, our ability to have data open and available is a great not only conversation starter, but it's a way to point somebody to something and say, here's something that you can do with, do something with right now. Um, so in that way, being able to do that and having standards about how um, geospatial data should be open, I think it's really supported it much more than it's limited. It. Great. Thank you very much, Dave. I, I think that's some, some really good feedback on that question and, and overall for the, the folks participating. Uh, seeing that we're at the top of 3 o'clock, we're going to take one more question and then we are going to close out this virtual training session. Uh, so let me just uh, cover the last question here and I can give you a second to provide an answer. How would you recommend enlisting and engaging the public in actually learning more about the importance of geospatial and how they can use it in a variety of ways for their own needs? It's a great question. Um, I, I'm going to be very honest. There is somebody here. Uh, I hope that, that I, I'm going to answer this in two ways. The first is um, the person who asked me, is asking the question, um, I please ask you to reach out to me. Uh, my email is there um, because, um, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, there are a number of people here that really work on this initiative, and there is somebody um, who I know would would probably be much better able. I know would be able, be able to answer this question better than I will. But um, one of the things that I will, uh, I, with that being said, um, how do I recommend enlisting, engaging the public? Um, in learning more about geospatial, you know, it goes back to that Governor O'Malley, you know, help me find my house. Um, you know, geospatial is a great conversation starter, but really what um, moves geospatial forward in the entirety of the history that I've worked with it, um, including here, is its ability to um, effectively visualize and solve problems. Um, it gets a conversation started and it makes the conversation relevant. Um, I would dare say that everybody has a um, it has a community um, that is very technically proficient. You know, whether it's a small community or whether it's a large community, but they're interested in knowing more about the things that you do. And the more you expose data and offer them not just data, but tools that allow them to use it. And these are very basic kinds of capabilities. I mean. You know, you can build somebody a nice little web, you know, application. Um, even now, you can use something like ArcGIS online. Um, you can allow that to be the way in which it starts a conversation um, and allows somebody to really organize that. Um, but I, I found that, you know, making the data available um, and then giving people kind of direction about the tools, how you can apply it, you know, what you can do with it, you know, showing them the art of the possible, just like I'm kind of illustrating to you here. Um, showing them how they can build a basic, you know, um, or incorporate a couple of data sets and then they're off and running. Um, it's pretty powerful and the technology is advanced to such a degree these days that it's not simply something that we have to own anymore. And I think that's the message that I would, I would take forward with that. But in terms of like a list of, of capabilities, there's no way I could cover all that here, but I encourage the person who is asking that to please reach out because I will connect you with someone who can give you a great set of, um, of uh, tools and techniques and methods that will probably really help you um, working with the community long term. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think those are some really good ideas and intangible ones for the participants to, to take forward and, and work on in their own communities. Um, we are going to 
wrap up here. So what I'd like to ask is that if folks have any remaining questions, uh, you did see Dave's email just previous. You can also feel free to send uh, myself uh, at rharnet at publicsafetygif.org any other outstanding questions, and we will compile those and get those over to Dave and then actually email you back responses. Uh, we're more than happy to do that because we realize there's a number of questions we weren't able to take. Uh, but I do want to just mention that, you know, this is a very productive session, and, and Dave, thank you for sharing uh, all of the exciting work that is going on in D.C. I, I think it really serves as a model for how you institute and establish a, a GIS program to support preparedness and resilience, um, as well as kind of a model for how other communities can do the same thing. And then some really specific applications, right, Go, going beyond that policy level, but into, in, into how geospatial can be used by decision makers across the spectrum, um, not just by fire chiefs and, and police chiefs, but also by heads of sanitation departments and transportation and others that interface with public safety. So. So thank you very much for sharing all of this with us today. And, and with that, I also want to thank all the participants for joining us. Uh, this was a very productive session. And uh, any last comments on your end, Dave, before we close out? No, just thanks everybody for joining today. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and this will conclude our virtual training on open data, GIS, and civic resilience. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.